Tonight's presentation, although edited for YouTube, contains imagery and subject matter some may find disturbing. While our program is educational, we still feel that viewer discretion is advised. In this article, Ms. Gore claimed that one of my songs, Under the Blade, had lyrics encouraging sadomasochism, bondage, and the words in question are about surgery and the fear that it instills in people. The reader of this article is led to believe that the three lines she quotes go together in the song, when as you can see from reading the lyrics, the first two lines she cites are an edited phrase from the second verse, and the third line is a misquote of a line from the chorus. As the creator of Under the Blade, I can say categorically that the only sadomasochism bondage in this song is in the mind of Ms. Gore. That was Dee Schneider from Twisted Sister speaking at a Senate hearing involving the potential censorship of music and its distribution. Limitations could have prevented certain songs or albums from being sold at public retailers, and also limit the visibility of songs that the government found to be objectionable, and force labels to put a descriptive list of every horrible kind of word that a child might hear. Tipper Gore, a future second lady, led a campaign against what she considered to be the Filthy 15, which included many popular artists like Madonna and ACDC. To give you an idea of how bad this could have been, songs like Twisted Sisters' We're Not Gonna Take It came under fire for promoting violence and youthful rebellion. What do you want to do with your life? I want to rock. If a song like that could land Dee Schneider in trouble, something that benign, imagine what would happen to just about every item on our list. Thankfully, due to the efforts of Dee Schneider, Frank Zappa, and John Denver, the Parents Music Resource Center, or the PMRC, backed off, compromising with an explicit lyric sticker to be applied at the label's discretion. That said, the alternative almost became a reality. It's undeniable that with such overbearing regulations in place, and such incompetent people in charge, music as a whole would be less rich for it. Today, in the name of youthful rebellion, we'd like to pay tribute and highlight the darker side of music and animation that was only made possible through their efforts. Honestly, I might not be the most qualified person to discuss music, but I do love dark and experimental animation and some of the most off-the-wall, awe-inspiring, emotionally heartfelt examples are found in the insane, subjective world of music. That's right, this one's for the misfits, the weirdos, and those that are just looking for a different perspective. But before we do that, today we have to thank the sponsors for making it possible to create videos just like this one, while also making it possible to pay our rent. For that we have to thank Raid Shadow Legends which is a game where you can collect and battle over 600 champions, testing their metal against dungeons, the aforementioned Doom Tower, or even other players in the PvP arena. One of the aforementioned dungeons, known as the Void Keep, is guarded by the subject of today's boss spotlight, Malik Kavar. This big lad has a nice stash of Void Potions, which could come in real big handy when it comes to ascending cool new champions but he'll guard it fiercely with an ability that has the potential to poison multiple champions each turn. You'll want to bring champions that can cleanse this poison before Malik can activate his ability, Bane, and cause all of the damage over time to proc at once. Raid Shadow Legends is a simple yet satisfying collectathon where you can collect and battle your own way. If you're settling for a session of grinding XP and silver, why not set your battles at times 2 speed or automatic mode and keep the rewards coming quickly while you multitask? I mean, it's on the phone and PC, it's not like they can really stop you. And coming new this month, Ray just released a new Doom Tower rotation with two new bosses, Astronix the Dark Fey and Bommel the Dreadhorn. This update also features new enemy balance on tower floors, new secret rooms to discover, and new artifact sets to win. 
One feature we would like to showcase before we end this out here is Super Raids. Super Raids lets you double up your rewards from hitting dungeons and massively speeds up your progress. If you want a head start, all you have to do is hit the link in the description or scan the QR code right here and new players will get a new epic hero Chanoru, 200k silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill, and 1 ancient shard, so you can summon an awesome champion as soon as you get in game. New players will find all these rewards in their inbox for the next 30 days only making this the best time to start playing Raid Shadow Legends if it was on your mind. Now with that out of the way, sit back, relax, turn down the lights, and prepare to feel something as we present nine of the darkest, most experimental animated music videos we could find. When researching our videos, we often try to find topics to discuss that fall within the intersection of two subjects which we find interesting. Subjects which go hand in hand like bizarre and disturbing, shocking and controversial, or in the case of this video, dark and experimental, are not the only threads which connect different items on our list, but a sliding scale where an item can fall more closely to one side than the other. With this in mind, Season 2, Episode 3 is one of the less dark items on our list, is described in an interview with lead vocalist Dave Bailey as a song about a girl who spends her entire time watching TV, lounging around, not doing anything, being high, and eating mayonnaise from a jar. Honestly, if that isn't a vibe, I don't know what is. Glass Animals is a British pop band from Oxford, which has not only seen platinum success from their 2014 single Gooey, but also released a host of unique and experimental music videos, from the two-part story told between youth and life itself, to the vivid provocative claymation of pools. The video which we decided to include on our list, however, is the third single leading up to the release of How to Be a Human Being, titled Season 2, Episode 3. It is the only Glass Animals track to be titled this way, meant to evoke the same feeling you might get from channel surfing with the help of a TV guide. The music video combines live action with pixel art animation to create something unique. Seeing the main character sucked into her television to a pseudo video game world with boss battles, various stages, and copious amounts of pixelated munchies. From beginning to end, it's definitely a trip with several references and callbacks which are more likely to be noticed on repeat viewings, and especially if you are familiar with the band's other music videos. Another quirk of Glass Animals is their tendency to use the lyrics of a song to portray a character sometimes even making the narration of the song from the perspective of the character it describes, or quoting something that the character might say in the lyrics. Season 2 Episode 3 depicts someone who spends most of their time relaxing and being lazy, which is even more relatable after trying to bide our time through a year of quarantines. The track is easy to listen to, with a laid back style and upbeat synth chords that'll make you want to take it easy in the most oversized sweatshirt you have. It can be fun to chill and veg out, but there is a degree of melancholy to the narrator's failure to motivate the directionless mayonnaise girl, someone who makes him laugh even though they are hopeless and not going to make it. After defeating what appears to be a rogue Boston Celtics player who clears that ball is life, before challenging mayonnaise girl to a street match of basketball baseball, an enormous brain cyclops creature surfaces from the bottom of the screen to reveal that it has captured all of the band members in a sequence which reminds me of the consumable items from Hylix. Luckily, the band is also saved, but only then do they reveal the video's darkest turn yet. That mayo definitely went bad. Well, that explains how we got here at least. <laughs> Season 2 Episode 3 is a vibe to say the least, with a fun and unique music video and a hook that is guaranteed to get stuck in your head for days. Survival of the fittest, a principle we've all heard of before, whether the context is social, political, or in the case of this next track by Pearl Jam, evolutionary. In Do the Evolution, the song's narrator is used to criticise the concept of social Darwinism and offer a grim warning for a future where the inconsiderate and irresponsible are drunk on the power that they feel from technology and innovation, believing that they control life on the planet. When the narrator affirms in the first verse that he is at peace with his lust, he is critiquing the concept in social Darwinism which argues that evolution gave human beings their wants thereby relieving humans of responsibility for their desires. He then follows it up with another viciously ironic line. 
I can kill because in God I trust. Which calls out institutions that claim authority over the lives of others, claiming even the authority to end a life. The music video is an animated compilation of mankind at its worst, leaving you hard pressed to find something in human history that do the evolution isn't critical of. If the art style seems reminiscent of DC animated series to you, that's because the video was co-directed by Kevin Ochieri, director of Batman the Animated Series, and Todd McFarlane, who worked on the comic book Spawn. There's even a reference to the DC character Death from The Sandman as depicted by a black-haired woman who dances and laughs throughout the video. The events as they proceed mimic the adage, violence begets violence, as one act of cruelty or inconsideration leads from one catastrophe to another in a causal chain. From our early history to modern lives, do the evolution cast light onto some of mankind's darkest deeds, from slavery to concentration camps to vivisection and even nuclear holocaust. It shows us the tools we've used to kill and destroy, beginning with clubs and swords forged in bronze and arriving at its logical conclusion with tanks and instruments of war. It especially shows us the cruelty we enact on one another as we whip, crucify, burn and enslave. All the while, the singer insists that it's evolution, baby, and that I'll do what I want, even if it's irresponsibly. Do the Evolution is a clear criticism of this careless dog-eat-dog -dog mentality and urges us to question the institutions that try to enact control over life, like politicians and established religion, as a final grim warning of mankind's trajectory. The music video depicts Earth bathed in nuclear fire and reduced to a charred husk. In this hypothetical end, we were unable to resist our own self-serving nature and destroyed one another as a result just to satisfy our ego and lust for power. The only solution is mutual respect for one another and a respect for life, even as it differs from our own values and preconceptions. Now this way, we might be able to avoid the grim future that do the evolution predicts. Life is scary, nothing is certain, and no one owes you unconditional love, but that doesn't mean that you don't deserve it. That's how I feel when listening to Jacob Collier's song, He Won't Hold You, featuring Rhapsody. You can hear a recreation of the song in the background right now, done by Edwin Paquin, who I'm hoping I pronounce his name right. He does a lot of pretty kick-ass stuff, all linked down below. All I do know is that this song actually helps me calm down. It's lonely, yet hopeful. It's sad and seemingly about a breakup, but it's also about growing up and learning from your past experiences and becoming a better person. To me, it's about combating toxic ideas and moving past them to see that everyone's different, but I'll get into that later. My neighbor is a music teacher that looks kind of like this, who I routinely hang out with and bounce ideas off during our nightly round tables. Naturally, while making this list, I showed him items and got his opinion. When I showed him, he won't hold you. He instantly recognized the name, Jacob Collier, and called him a genius. Generally, I try to trust the opinions of people who are experts in their respective fields, so starting from that point, I started to do some research on Jacob Collier, and I was genuinely surprised. He is a rather interesting individual that combines gospel and wide harmonic sections with acoustic instrumentals to create these grand, highly emotional, experimental music videos. Even when the music videos are not animated, they're still experimental, grandiose, and absolutely insane. I highly recommend checking out his YouTube channel, which at the time of the writing of the script has almost 900,000 subscribers. He Won't Hold You, released on July 16th, 2020, is a five minute animated music video that uses black and white visuals to convey loneliness through the use of negative space. This song seems to be about someone going through a breakup and not being able to deal with the aftermath only to realize that it takes separation in order to gain perspective needed to understand what you want. There are a few interpretations that one could come out with, but let me tell you one that I've come up with. In the introduction, the chorus sings, he won't hold you like I do, he won't bring out the love in you, and now I'm lost, I'm on my own, I feel so lonely, won't you resurrect me? Ending this section with, I won't be alright, I won't be alright. I believe this is the he or the boyfriend in the situation trying to say that he's the only one that can be for the subject of the song. 
the classic, I love you like no one else will or no one else can, which is a sentiment that a lot of people have and feel when going through a breakup, especially when it's with a person that you still have love for, but don't reciprocate. In the music video, we see this represented by a male figure at a piano, almost in complete darkness. The only light in the room is the natural sunlight coming from the window, which is quickly settling and threatening to plunge the male into complete darkness. The camera then zooms out to show the cityscape at night. The male figure is alone, seemingly more insignificant, as the hustle and bustle of the city obscures him in a sea of strangers. We then cut to the female subject of the song, which is rap, sung, or poetrized by Rap City. Here we get a poem about how she feels about the situation. The most notable lines that really stick out to me are, I learned value of what we had taught by pain, learned the other side's grass wasn't as green, I bloomed, I grew, took separation to get closer to you, you didn't let go, and I held on too, your arms are my armor, yet karma cut us loose, you learned value. I learned truth. And finally, I had to face myself, my fears, my fails, found liberation, found my freedom, where it begins is without you. Which to me communicates that she was committed to this relationship and held on to it too, but when stuck in such a intense situation, it's hard to see the real flaws that is preventing it from being what you need, which is completely different for every person. This leads to resentment. Once out of this toxic relationship, she sees areas where she made mistakes, where she learned how much he truly valued her. The grass was not greener without him, but at least she learned what she needed from him, but expresses regret that it's too late to fix what had already been broken and damaged. As she sings her part, the he won't hold you from the chorus plays in the background, but significantly faded and quiet as she speaks her truth. It should also be noted that unlike the man who's falling into darkness, the female is entirely standing there in the light, which contrasts the emptiness that the man now feels. He is lost, but she has gained some perspective. The song ends with the cityscape again, but this time it's lit up and in the first time of the song, actually portrayed with colors in this trippy watercolor style. The man's looking out the window, however, he only can see the black and white of the world around him. Ending with the simple line, I won't be alright, showing that he's still bleeding and it may take time to heal this wound. When will Claymation ever not be dark and disturbing? Sober is the first music video by the band Tool to be animated in stop motion, only showing flashes of the band members and focusing instead on the live action clay figure. The song was recorded for their 1992 album, Tales from the Dark Side, with the music video being released a year later, directed by stop motion animator Fred Stewart and featuring models designed by the band's own guitarist, Adam Jones. Jones would go on to share the band's inspiration for the song, stating in an interview that the song and video are based on a guy we know is at his artistic best when he's loaded or under the influence, also admitting that people give him a lot of shit for it. This ties into the first line of the chorus which asks, why can't we not be sober? Confusing double negative aside, this is a rhetorical question that gives credence to the artist Jones described in his interview by implying that people have the right to choose to live their lives intoxicated if it suits them. The repeating line at the end, I want what I want, reinforces this choice, insisting that people cannot choose what they desire or at least that it isn't the fault of the user becoming addicted. Whether you agree with this message or not, the music video is rife with imagery that is up to multiple interpretations. Adam Jones even stated that different people get different things out of the images. It doesn't matter what it's about. All that matters is how it makes you feel. The subject of the video, for instance, might have his wrinkled and disheveled appearance due to the harmful effects of the drugs he's taken, or his appearance might be a reflection of the jaded or depressed emotions which turn him to those drugs. Nevertheless, when the subject happens upon a sealed box in the nook of the dingy home he lives in, the contents seem to literally and figuratively elevate him, while also causing him to exhibit jitters and shakes much like the side effects of harmful drugs. 
There are more disturbing revelations as the video continues, such as the dangerous holes these boxes are located in or the seemingly disfigured man being kept inside the closet. There's even a pipe inside the house which seems to be inexplicably filled with meat. All of this raises the question as to whether the clay man lives in such fear and danger because of the drugs that elevate him and melt his face, or if the drugs are a coping tool which allows a brief respite from the living nightmare. While the music video doesn't seem to offer any concrete answers, we can look to the lyrics again to find a warning in the song's bridge. I am just a worthless liar. I am just an imbecile. I will only complicate you. Trust in me and fall as well. The speaker in this case does not want any help for his problems with drugs, insisting that trying to get close or help will only lead to the downfall of that well-intentioned person. Regardless of what came first, the living nightmare is the reality of the clay man now. There is no hope in sight, and even if things do improve, relapse is an inevitability. This feeling of being unable to escape or break the cycle is perhaps the darkest thing about sober. And it's all too relatable to many people struggling with the abuse of drugs or the difficulty of rehabilitation. When we discuss experimental music, we refer to pieces of art that are innovative. They may involve styles or techniques which are untested and unproven. Many of these works of avant-garde influence the art which succeeds them. We'd like to posit that this would make the world's first animated music video experimental by definition. Accidents Will Happen is a new wave song by Elvis Costello and the Attractions, which was initially a more personal piece about Costello's struggles with honesty and infidelity in relationships, though the lyrics were later changed to make it seem less like the song was talking specifically about himself. He reasoned that this was pop music, not confession. Accidents Will Happen is widely regarded to be one of Elvis Costello's greatest songs, though this is not the only claim to fame for this music video. Not only is it considered to be the first animated music video, but it also contains the first computer-generated moving image in a music video as well. While Accidents Will Happen is animated traditionally with ink and paint, for the most part, the music video's director also used a university computer to draw a green on black vector image of the lead singer at a variety of angles, then filmed it right from the screen with a Bolex 16mm camera. The video itself seems to show mostly disjointed images of common mishaps and blunders ranging from mundane to catastrophic. The variety of accidents on display could be as simple as breaking a mug to as complex and deadly as an unintended nuclear launch. During the chorus, the imagery shifts to distorted shots of the band members playing their instruments as if on a shoddy old television. While it might not seem all that special to us today, this was ahead of its time in 1979. And for that reason, it's hard to argue against something so groundbreaking being one of the most experimental items on our list. Mick Bass is a French illustrator and musician operating out of London, at least depending on what source you actually read. He, along with Matt Christensen and Gregory Tallon, combined their efforts to create these strange, dark, psychedelic, rubber hose style animated music videos. And if I could only use one word to describe the relaxing music and cheerful animations, it would be deceptive. While listening, I get this feeling that someone wants me to let down my guard for some insidious purpose. While at first the animations and songs seem inviting enough, much like those old 30 styles cartoons were designed to be, there's always little details both in the lyrics and visuals to let you know that something is wrong. Most specifically, I found that this line right here in the song She's a Big Boy to be the most unsettling. As you can see, the song is relaxing and the synths are inviting, but the contents are nothing short of morbid. Much like most of all of McBasie's work, actually. Often enough, these songs lure you in with soft, inviting synths and long-winded solos, only to twist that expectation. McBest would describe this line of music as McBasie, at least if you believe his Dot Ninja website, which, from what we can understand, is a sort of sandbox project that is 
materializing his smoothest impulses with the right touch of weird in an attempt to capture a post-apocalyptic mood. And yeah, they hit the nail on the head right there. Weird and experimental is a good word to describe a lot of this guy's music. Like with his song, Water Slide, he depicts hell as a series of infinitely looping water slides that may or may not be full of cheese. Or like in their song, Dead Pirates, we get to see a poor drum man knock his own teeth out repeatedly to the tune of the song that you're actively listening to. The off-the-wall surrealness of Macbeth's work is what makes his stuff fun to explore, yet unsettling when you dive in deep. We all like to think we understand how things work and we have these neat, concise answers. For a lot of people, admitting that you don't is incredibly difficult to do. So when confronted with something brimming with unsettling, mildly threatening undertones that seems to invite you in, it can immediately create a feeling of distress, which at least in our opinion is pretty cool. The lyrics subvert the instrumentals, and the visuals subvert the traditionally child-friendly art style, and Macbeth has truly created something unique here. The song we wanted to highlight today is She's a Big Boy, which got me through the creation of many videos since its release. This would also mark the first song that Macbeth fully animated this in color and in our opinion is one of the best places to start when jumping down this experimental rabbit hole. Something to also note about Macbeth before moving on is that a lot of his music contains nude animated Barbie doll anatomy women, usually just relaxing or unknowingly doing something dangerous, all with a smile on their face. It's uncanny and adds to the sexually charged vibe that a lot of his songs have. Like with most music videos, there's no real storyline here. We just see a lot of images that depict some sort of Tom and Jerry style like house, hands coming out of everything and everything, and whatever is uh, nice about this, I will never know. Many words both in the song and in the background are repeated with the main chorus repeating, she's a big boy now, she's got her hair and her shoes all tied up in a noose with this horrifying visual playing out. Then, after going down the river, we cut to a road figure making ravioli and spiking it with opium and other dangerous shit. The ravioli is then pushed down the river where the girls are seen eating it and everything gets a bit more uh, trippy. After a nice, calm, instrumental cool break, we once again go down the river, but this time the creators of the song appear as ravioli men to play out the end of the song. As you can tell, everything from the animation to the music appeals to pretty much everything I love. It's weird, dark, kinda messed up if you think about it, and presented in a nice, relaxed tone. She's a Big Boy, along with most of Macbeth's work, is nothing short of both beautiful and deeply unsettling and experimental. Of course, how could we make a list of experimental music videos without including one of the industry's most influential virtual bands, Gorillaz? We call Gorillaz a virtual band because the bandmates aren't real people, only existing within the world of their animated music videos. That doesn't just make them mascots, however. Russell, Murdoch, Tootie, and Noodle are all characters with backstories and arcs that evolve over the band's various phases, giving each album a new look to go with a fresh sound. Featuring creative designs by Jamie Hewlett, composition by Damon Albarn, and a host of collaborators both large and small which will become a staple of the band, Gorillaz has consistently topped the charts in the US and UK since the early 2000s. The band began as a side project for Damon Albarn to experiment with different sounds that didn't fit his band Blur. The mix of alternative and electronic pop was quickly met with positive reception with the instantly recognizable Feel Good Inc. on the album Demon Days, which went platinum six times over in the UK. After the release of Plastic Beach, however, the project would be put on hiatus for seven years, and much like the Avatar, would leave fans wondering when they would get to see the best virtual band again. When the Gorillaz did return in 2017, it was to a rapidly changing world and political turmoil. 
The inauguration that year spurred Gorillaz and their collaborators to take on a much darker and postmodern tone with their new album, Humans, which would go on to be described as a doomsday music festival on record for its deeply critical takes on the political and social landscape of the time. Perhaps most compelling in its lyrics and visuals, Hallelujah Money was a single which prefaced the release of the album in order to coincide with the day of the inauguration that year. Featuring vocals from Mercury Prize winner Benjamin Clementine, Hallelujah Money parodies sermons and political rallies mocking the greed of the newly inaugurated president preaching about how money is more important than love or morals. A projector is used to bathe the speaker in light and distressing imagery like footage from a KKK rally and scenes from the 1954 Animal Farm movie, which, as a fun side fact, was partially funded by the CIA. As if the close shot with Benjamin's deadpan expression wasn't disconcerting enough, the falsetto wail of hallelujah money is downright chilling. A fun final tidbit about Hallelujah Money is that the version on the Gorillaz YouTube channel actually differs from the version on the album, ending with this clip from the SpongeBob SquarePants episode Karate Choppers, possibly to jump scare the viewer. Hallelujah Money! <laughs> With that out of the way, we wanted to call attention to one of Gorilla's darkest and most experimental music videos yet, Spirit House, which is a 360 animated music video showcasing snippets of several songs from humans and acting as the music video for Saturn's Bars. One of the first of its kind, Spirit House remains the most successful debut of a 360 music video. But that's not the only thing to make the track stand out. The gorillas are no stranger to horror-inspired settings for their music videos, wearing this influence proudly in early videos like Clint Eastwood and Rocket, but Spirit House takes the cake for blending these elements into a trippy descent into madness. The video begins with the band driving to an abandoned house which is actually based on a real-life residence in Detroit, Michigan. They leave the car to ring the doorbell, but the house is foreboding, to say the least. Once inside, the band members decide to split up and explore, but with the gang separated, strange things start happening. Murdoch becomes lost in a dark void, and the other band members are harassed by monsters and poltergeists, making it quickly apparent that they are at the mercy of the machinations of the spirit house. Featured in Saturn's bars is the Jamaican DJ Popcon, who adds a very unique flow to the track with his distinct bars and dialect. In his verse, Popcon raps about the hardship he has faced growing up in a developing country and the social systems which turned many other young men like him to crime. Popcon feels jaded to his success because of his past experiences, leaving him disillusioned with wealth and fame. 2D reflects this sentiment when he joins in for his verse, in which he reveals he is questioning his entire existence, unable to distinguish reality. Both singers feel powerless in their situation, with Popcon dissatisfied by the ebb and flow of wealth and success, and 2D unable to reconcile his existential crisis or the debts he feels he has accrued from past relationships. Spirit House is about more than just a house that is haunted. It's about the baggage we all carry, and all the inner demons we feel helpless towards. Whether the weight of past experiences leaves you feeling like you're being crushed between the coils of a snake, or feelings you're unable to reconcile leave you floating and lost, we can relate to one another through the inner turmoil that is shared by all humans. Voodoo Magic is the latest single from indie folk punk band The Front Bottoms, which was released earlier this year with an animated music video on the band's YouTube channel. The Front Bottoms, which began as a duo between childhood friends Brian Seller and Matt Juchek, has been well received for their intensely authentic sound which pulls no punches. It's difficult to place exactly what makes The Front Bottoms sound so real, but we compare them to another anarcho-folk band, Johnny Hobo and the Freight Trains. Listen to this horn player from Love Songs for the Apocalypse and tell me that it doesn't sound like they found him in the same dumpster as the trumpet he's playing. And we mean that in the best possible way.
From the grunge-inspired guitar licks to the nasally and slightly off-key vocalist, the Front Bottoms music is richer for refusing to hide its flaws, encouraging the listener to fall into their rhythms and deeply catchy tunes through relatability. If there was a sheer opposite to Overproduced, it would be this band. The other thing that makes the Front Bottoms so relatable is the content of their lyrics. Brian Seller is unafraid to tackle heavier subjects with his purely grounded attitude, which creates a refreshing blend of genuine and emotional lyrics with light-hearted, uninhibited musical stylings. While the subject matter of voodoo magic isn't as heavy as some of their other tracks, like Lone Star, which discusses one of Seller's friend's real-life experiences with unplanned pregnancy and abortion, it is absolutely true to the Front Bottom's down-to-earth vibe. We've all had days where it seems like everything that could go wrong does. Whether it's a piece of bad news following an unfortunate accident, or a series of unlucky circumstances, misfortune has a way of compounding itself. When it rains, it pours after all. In these moments of weakness, it's normal to imagine that the world might be conspiring against us. I need to remind ourselves that we might just be unlucky. The titular voodoo magic that Sella sings about refers to this very suspicion that our own misfortune might have something to do with something superstitious, which is a sensation shared by even the most pragmatic individuals. The video itself follows one such day for a character who looks suspiciously like the Front Bottoms lead singer and is animated in a rough style without any concern for being visually pleasing. The music video is full of unflattering faces and bizarre injuries that don't shy away from depicting the indignity of having a day when nothing goes right. This lack of polish and refusal to make anything glamorous or attractive is a perfect fit for the Front Bottoms' imperfect sound, demonstrating the effort the band puts into nailing down that specific, down-to-earth vibe they provide. In this final third of the video, the idea that we can all relate to having days like this is reinforced by a shift in perspective. After the yellow shirt guy collides with the skater on the escalator, we change to her perspective and realize something that wouldn't be apparent from the outside looking in. The skater is having a bad day of her own. The song ends after we watch her struggle to get back to her apartment, awkwardly interacting with strangers, then later getting a piece of bad news via a text message. There's not only a sense of schadenfreude from seeing the misfortune of the yellow shirt guy, but also dramatic irony with the knowledge that he wouldn't have believed his bad day was the product of voodoo magic if he'd just known what the skater was going through. You see, some days we're just unlucky, but it's a comforting and human experience to know that everyone has days like these. In our video, 12 Controversial and Disturbing Animated Movies, we used a short clip from the song Cats, Dogs, and Rats by Rare Americans as an example of disturbing media that is impactful. This was the first song I had ever heard from the band, and its subject matter hit me in the right way at the right time to give me a genuine sense of dread, which is something that not a lot of punk rock songs are able to do. Needless to say, Rare Americans is one of my favorite mostly animated bands. They make animated music videos featuring a wide cast of characters, some of which are anthropomorphic for additional symbolism. By the way, before we continue, I just want to be upfront and say that Rare Americans is political and it would actually be impossible to talk about them without bringing up some of the subject matter. If that will bother you, and trust me, I understand if it might, maybe consider skipping the rest of this segment. A perfect example of this would be their song Knives, Guns, and Bed, where we see an American Eagle lady with a gun fight a panda cop that fires tear gas at protesters, clearly drawing allusions to the Free Hong Kong movement and the American BLM movement. Then we have more abstract stuff, like Hullabaloo and The Monies, which mostly focuses on the corruption of big businesses while commenting on other current events that I don't have the time or energy to dive too deep into. What I like most about this set of songs, though, is the way that they depict corporations and consumerism with a 1980s four-style sense of nonsensical, surreal dystopia. I think there might be something wrong with us. 
that's not to say that every rare American song is political or heavy. If you're looking for a less emotional starting point, I'd suggest one of their more recent songs, Rhythm Kitchen, which is mostly about loving life and moving on. On the darker end of the spectrum, we also have songs like Ryan and Dave, which talks about two friends that drifted apart, one getting a job, another falling on hard times, only to come back together and ultimately take that first step towards getting help. And anyone who's had friends or family like I have fallen prey to addiction, this scene here might feel uncomfortably familiar. Addiction is a reoccurring theme in their music, like with the song Gas Mask, which also shows how hard it is to struggle with addiction, to pull yourself up, and to move on. Moving on and becoming a better person would likely be the mantra for just about every song these guys have made, which is sort of why I've fallen in love with this band. Their most popular work and the subject of today's list was produced in 2019 and maybe concluded in 2021. Brittle Bones Nikki and its sequel Brittle Bones Nikki 2 tells the story of an orphan whose father used to regularly abuse him, while his mother was unfortunately killed by a bad man. Despite this, Nick never let other people push him around, rebelling against an unfair system every step of the way, whether it was putting a pie in shifty space or punching a cop that was overstepping his authority or saving his only friend from three convicts, Nicky never backed down. Despite not winning at the game of life, Nick is satisfied knowing that he lived a good one, which is where part two begins. Nick has died and is now on a roller coaster through purgatory where a driver named Hank guides him to his ultimate fate right in front of the gates, which is depicted here as a neon zap zone. Despite thinking he did the best he could with the unfortunate start given to him, God said that Nick didn't live a moral life and neither did his loving mother. Basically, morality is objective and no matter what your reasons for stealing or defending yourself, all of these actions are sins and deserving of hell. Hide a shifty space, away with your mates, scout your fakes, and take your sins in our place. After being thrown into hell, the person that Nick say before Ben offers to help him out, not one to let others push him around, Nicky makes his way into the devil's chambers, where he finds that God and the devil are the same person rolled into one. Nick makes a deal with him and becomes one of the skelly men referenced in the first song, doing God's bidding to add a chaotic spice to life. Brittle Bones Nicky combines a dark message with bright, upbeat instrumentals, essentially saying that the world is chaotic and even if you fight back, it will only get worse worse for you, but there is a sense of satisfaction with saying that at least you tried to do something, even if it doesn't lead to any change at all. With its sequel, it wants to commentate on how morality cannot be rigid and moral, that subjectivity needs to be applied otherwise you end up punishing people who honestly did not intend to do anything wrong at all. At least, that's my take. Which, I'll be completely honest, like with just about everything on this list, could be completely wrong. The only thing I do know for sure is that, at least to me, these guys preach that the world is unfair, but that's not an excuse to be a bad person, and that you should always strive for personal growth and stand up for what you believe in. Otherwise, someone will take advantage of that apathy, which is a message that not only resonates with me, but also on some subconscious level deeply disturbs me. Since our video got delayed due to freak storms and power outages, my sick dog of all things, and many, 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 many more technical difficulties, we have decided to add Opal as a sort of bonus item to our list since Opal isn't just a animated music video, but rather a entire 12 minute animated musical. We've actually covered Jack Stalber before on this channel in one of my favorite videos to date, six of the most disturbing animations on the internet. This is because his work has always struck a chord with me. I mean, who else can make a musical opera about shopping at a grocery store that makes me question my own existence? Wait, this milk is expired. Expired. What kind of life did you live through? 
Whether we're talking about his humor, the downright uncomfortable mixed media visuals, or Jack's depictions of human fears and anxiety, through it all, I see a bit of myself in these weird clay people. In a sense, it actually can be almost cathartic watching some of Jack's work. He adds layers upon layers of meaning and symbolism in a lot of his videos, which can be easily missed upon a first viewing, which of course benefits freaks like me who just like to rewatch and dissect the same thing over and over again. This sentiment is doubly true for the sub of today's bonus list item thing, Opal, which has taken the internet by storm, garnering over 3.1 million views in less than 10 months, and inspiring a cool reanimated project which you can find both on screen right now and link down below. With that said, Opal is a 12 minute animated musical containing multiple songs that paint a grim picture of the hellish reality that this young child lives in. However, it should be noted that what we learn is pretty abstract and can be interpreted interpreted in many different ways. So I'll do my best to give a general summary of what I think happened. After all, it's music and everything's subjective. Although, I must admit that I actually do think that there's definitely a concrete story here. It's possible that I could just be giving a completely wrong interpretation of it. The musical starts with some symbolic imagery that will make more sense when I explain it later. Then we transition into the first song. In this opening number, we're introduced to a little girl who we will refer to as Opal, having dinner with what appears to be her family. They sing about seeing her. We see you, Opal, your troubles are miles away. Which will be important later. For now, Opal seems to be pretty happy to have the acknowledgement of this family after showing off something worth, uh, seeing. <laughs> Her attention is brought to the window, showing this foreboding house in the distance which captivates Opal. Her attention is pulled away from the other house when the loving family interjects with what could be taken as a warning. Don't mind the house across the street, it's not where your attention ought to be. Something about the house piques Opal's morbid curiosity, leaving her with no choice but to sneak out and enter. On the inside, we are treated to three more songs featuring creepy alternative versions of the family we saw earlier, starting with Grandpa followed by father, then mother. When Opal enters the living room of this house, Grandpa refers to her as Claire, and she seems genuinely fearful as he starts addressing her and demanding cigarettes, accusing her of trying to hide them. Grandpa is this elderly, confused blind man, and in his song, Why Does It Sound So Easy To Breathe On TV, he expresses fear that the voices on TV want to take his soul. Even though the tune is upbeat, some of the musical choices are downright unsettling, like in this clip here. Won't you tell me? After Grandpa's song, he starts screaming at Opal to get out and chases her up the stairs, since she never responds in any way, leading him to believe that she's not Claire. Opal at this point is stopped by Father, who sits in what he calls the reflection chamber, wearing a contraption that surrounds him with hanging mirrors from all angles. My roommate believes that he suffers from some sort of deformation and now spends all of his time trying to make himself look good, or as Father puts it, They turned me down, now I live my nightmare. Opal is stopped and held verbally hostage while he tries to spark a conversation about himself. I'm going to be completely upfront, Father's song Mirror Man has some of the most uncomfortable imagery in it. Something about the synthesis of skin and claymation combined with the warping just makes my spine and skin crawl. Mirror Man is interrupted as Grandpa makes his way up the stairs and starts screaming at Opal, causing her to run away while the Mirror Man says this. You know how this makes me feel? This leads us to one of the last songs in the music video. Shutting the door behind her, Opal finds herself inside a dingy room with booze and pills all over the ground. The thing that has sparked her curiosity is just further down the hall. Unfortunately, her plan is stopped as Mother grabs her by the ankle, knocking her down, saying this. I forgive every single one of you, every night. <laughs> it's a virtuous cycle. In her song, Virtuous Cycle, Mama sings about how she needs a little girl to hold on to and to fall on. This is an admission that she cannot validate her existence without her daughter. As Mama sings and speaks, it's hard to shake this feeling that she's intoxicated as she slurs her speech and her eyes look everywhere but forward, in a sense, unable to see her own daughter. The song ends with a loud shrieking noise and a collection of images. If we slow this down a little, 
little bit, we see someone dial 911, pills occasionally flashing, and of course, Mama's deformed, half-melted face screeching, which should give you an idea of what we are in for later. After putting the fear of God into Opal, she bolts towards the attic, knocking over a bottle of booze and a glass of wine, locking the door behind her. Opal notices a bed with pink sheets before turning her attention across the street. She's nearly brought to tears as her despondent gaze stares across at the street where her old house used to stand. In its place, a solitary billboard that reads, Opal's Burgers. Mother, father, and grandpa bang against the door as we see some more symbolic imagery, and the room around her starts to morph into some sort of hellscape, ending the video with the girl retreating back into her own mind for a reprisal of We See You. If I'm not mistaken, Opal is supposed to be Claire and is the daughter that Mama sings about. The reason why the first song is titled, We See You, is because no one in the house actually looks at her or sees her, both physically and figuratively. The grandpa is blind and confused, the father has the three mirrors in front of him and never stops talking and pitying himself, and Mama is so strung out and abusive towards Opal that getting anything out of her seems to be a impossible Herculean task. Opal also never talks in this animated musical, which is quite fitting for someone who feels like they have no voice inside of their own home. Mama talks about feeling awful and always having to forgive people, using Claire as a crutch and putting that burden entirely on her. Claire looks at the billboard across the street and imagines her family being kind, one that would see her for who she really is. Because the messed up alternative of leaving this fantasy is accepting the hell which her mind helps her shut out. The imagery we saw at the beginning being disturbing and foreshadowing for what would end up coming up later. At least, that's my personal take, and honestly, it could be wrong. Opal is dark, experimental as hell, with both its sound, visuals, and writing. Not only making this a incredibly experimental and dark piece of media to include on our list, but perhaps making this one of Jack Stalber's most disturbing pieces, period. It looks like you made it to the end of yet another video, and I just quickly want to apologize to the patrons for not putting up the splash screen this time around, mainly because I didn't have a lot of time to put it up, and I was not gonna delay this any more than I already had. That said, if you donated any money now, I'll make sure to get you the next time around. Also, if you are a Patreon subscriber and you want access to my new album, Empathy, feel free to message me on Discord literally anytime and I'll send it over. For the rest of you, it's on Bandcamp for 5 bucks. It's been a long couple of months, but I'm hoping to have some great content in the future. Currently, I'm working on the disturbing video game Iceberg that I'm hoping to have out by Halloween. If you have suggestions on obscure or weird or very disturbing video games you'd like to see on the Iceberg, please comment below because I'm still taking in suggestions and I really don't want to miss anything. So yeah, with that said, I'm absolutely exhausted and ready to conclude this project and begin my next one. I hope you guys have a absolutely beautiful life. I've been your host, That Creepy Reading, and for now, I'm signing off.